joining us for this episode of Recipe Share, a program on AADL-TV where we take a few minutes to talk about recipes in a featured category. Today's category is Savory Bakes. I'm Katie, and as usual, I'm joined by Elizabeth and Beth, and today we also have a very special guest, our library co-worker, Emily, and we are all going to share our recipes with you. So, Elizabeth, tell us what you chose today. Okay, thanks, Katie. Well, as you all know, I'm not a big baker, um, but I'm especially not a big sweet baker, so I appreciated the opportunity to do a savory bake for this um, theme. And um, what I chose was a uh, savory cornbread with jalapenos and feta. Um, I've always really liked cornbread. Um, I grew up, my chili and cornbread was a pretty like common recipe growing up. Um, and my mom would always make a cornbread from scratch. It was really good. Um, and as I, I often, I will make cornbread when I make chili. So that's like one of the few things that I bake. So I found this recipe from William Sonoma. Um, and it was really interesting. You actually bake it in like a loaf pan. Like you might bake like a banana bread or something. And it was kind of cool. So basically, um, I'm not going to go into the details of the cornbread batter. It's pretty standard with cornmeal flour. Um, you do add a little bit of sour cream, which was nice, um, and also a little bit of cumin. Um, but then the kind of interesting part is you do some add-ins to the batter and also some toppings. So you thinly slice four green onions. You mince half of a small red onion. You crumble seven ounces of feta cheese. Um, yours, it calls for an ear of corn. It's uh, March as we're recording this. So that was canned corn for me, or I mean, sorry, frozen corn for me. Um, and um, two um, seeded and diced jalapenos. So um, after you've made the batter, um, you fold in a tablespoon each of green onions, red onions, feta, corn, and then all of the diced jalapeno. Um, I actually did a little more. I always feel like a tablespoon is such a small amount, and it seemed like that was like a lot left over for toppings. So I probably did closer to like three tablespoons of everything folded in, and then that seemed like a more reasonable amount to put on top. Um, you bake it for 50 minutes at 350 degrees. Um, and then you take it out and like drizzle a little olive oil on and then put it back in for like 15 to 20 minutes more. I'm not a baker. So none of this made sense to me. I just follow the directions. Like I don't have any intuition when it comes to baking, but then I did stick a knife in it. I do know that trick and just made sure it came out clean. So I was like, okay, we're good with that. Um, and then you, um, Oh, sorry, I forgot about this. So basically when you drizzle the olive oil, you also put the other toppings on. So then they're gonna kind of bake. And it said like, you should check on it because if they start to get too crispy, you can cover it with foil, which I did do because it just seemed like maybe they, like the onions were getting a little burned at the edges. So I just threw some foil on and it turned out great. Um, so then you pull it out, check to make sure it's done, which it was. Everything was like really nice. The feta was melted. The toppings were a little crispy. It looked really beautiful. Um, and then you basically just let it cool. It said at the end, you could um, garnish with like some more fresh sliced jalapeno. I don't know. It seemed fine to me. I didn't do that. Um, but it was really yummy. And I liked too, they said that like, you could serve it with chili, but also it's just really good with like a smear of butter, um, as kind of a savory snack. And, um, I almost thought like there was so much going on that I'm not sure I would serve it with chili. I think I would usually make my more like I usually just make like cheddar cornbread with chili just cause like the, you know, I, whatever. Anyway, so this was almost more of a like snack bread type thing but it was really good and I enjoyed it and I loved having all of the flavors in there and I thought it was a cool idea and the toppings did look really cool on top so that was kind of a neat um thing and um it was good you know I don't know how often I'll make this because it is like a loaf of 
I don't know, you know, but it was good. And it would be really fun to like bring to something because it looks cool and then you can slice it up and everyone could enjoy it. So I think it would be a great dish to like pass. Um, yeah, so that's my savory jalapeno feta cornbread. Sounds amazing. <laughs> and I could see it with just going alongside a salad or something, you know? I was even yeah. thinking for breakfast, like an easy breakfast <laughs> loaf, right? Like that's so versatile. Yeah, um, you could like put an over easy egg on it. That would be good. Oh, sure. Yeah, that yeah. sounds fabulous. I also love that it has cumin in it. I think I'm going to steal that idea with my more basic cornbread because I just, yeah, just throw it into it. Yeah. And that sounds really good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. done cheddar with cornbread too. So I also really appreciated the feta. I've never... Yeah thought about that before I bet that's nice and creamy I can't wait to try this sounds Me good it, it was good it was good I look forward to hearing about it if any of you try it so and you you did say you use fresh jalapenos I did, did yeah and it calls to like just kind of seed them and dice them mm -hmm. so okay very yeah. nice okay Emily I'm excited I know you're an avid baker so tell us what you made I am an avid baker and I kind of cheated with the theme this time because I couldn't help but share um, what is like my family's family recipe because you do bake it, but it's really more cooking. It's my mom's chicken pot pie. Um, and so the, the really the closest thing to baking is making your pie crust. And I'll be honest with this, it's enough work for uh, making the filling that usually I just use a Pillsbury pie crust, uh, but you if you're feeling ambitious, make whichever is your favorite. Um, but it is kind of a classic chicken pot pie. And you, you take about a pound of cooked chicken. Usually we do uh, chicken breasts and boil them, but you could use rotisserie chicken. You could use leftovers. It's really forgiving. And I say about a pound because almost all of these measurements, especially of the vegetables and the meat, uh, can be whatever you have. Um, so. Uh, Go with what, what looks good and what you're able to buy. Uh, same about a pound of potatoes, uh, really whatever kind you want. I have not made it with sweet potatoes, but now I'm kind of curious, though I don't think those flavors would match very well. Uh, my favorite is to use red potatoes. And if the skin looks nice, I leave the skin on the potatoes. I think getting that little bit of color in the pie is good and they get that nutrition that's in the peels. Uh, but if the skin is looking a little ratty or you just prefer not to have that added texture peel them that's fine uh key ingredient parsnips i think parsnips are an unsung hero in savory foods take three big parsnips maybe a little more maybe a little less again whatever looks good peel those cut those into bite-sized pieces about five large carrots peeled bite-sized pieces get the drill uh, and about a cup of frozen peas and let them thaw somewhat. What I do usually is I take the peas, I measure them out, and then I start peeling and prepping all the other ingredients. And then they've thawed enough by the time they all go together. And then you take all those vegetables. Um, chicken is cooked, so you can just set it aside and not worry about it yet. Um, and boil them with a little bit of added salt until they're tender. Um, all depends on how high heat and how much you like your vegetables cooked, knowing that they are gonna go in the oven. Uh, so usually what I'll do to test is test the potato because everything else, if it's got a little bite to it, eh, who cares? Uh, but a uh, raw potato is not ideal. Um, so I'll test a potato to decide when they're done and just drain them and then return them to the big pot you boiled them in. And that's when you gently mix in your cooked chicken as well. Um, and then you set that pot aside and get a big uh, saute pan and melt your butter in that skillet. So you take about a third a cup of butter and a large onion. Usually I use a white onion, but a yellow onion or even a red onion in a pinch if that's what you've got works. Chop it and you're essentially starting out by making a roux. Um, so you get your butter and your onion and then take a third a cup of flour and whisk that in as well. Uh, once that's all incorporated, uh, then you put in two cups of milk and one cup of chicken broth. Uh, I've found that if, like me, you're lactose intolerant and don't want to give up chicken pot pie, uh, oat milk works really well as a substitute. I have, side by side comparison, noticed no difference. Um, but I notice the difference later when my stomach doesn't hurt. Uh, so mix those in and let the sauce um, get thick 
and um, bubbly. And then comes time for the key secret ingredient, which is Zender's chicken seasoning. Uh, this is sent uh, by the, it's created by the Zender's chicken restaurant and Frankenmuth. Uh, and it really makes all the difference there. So if you run out, which happens in my family and try to substitute it, you could substitute it for some salt and some tarragon, but don't do it. <laughs> just, just get this seasoning. Uh, you can buy it from their store online. You can buy it from Amazon, uh, or you can use it as an excuse to go to take a trip to Frankenmuth. Uh, but that really is what sets this pie apart. Um, so yeah, mix that and some black pepper into the sauce, stir it all together, taste it. Um, usually I start with about a tablespoon of the chicken seasoning and about a teaspoon of pepper. And I almost always uh, end up adding another half tablespoon of the chicken seasoning. And then sometimes I'll still add a little salt. Uh, I do tend to like things on the salty side, uh, but salt is also one of those flavor enhancers. So it brings out the flavors of the other spices you have. Uh, obviously you can't take it away after you add it, uh, but definitely taste it. And if you go, this just doesn't have enough flavor, odds are good, you need a little more salt. Uh, so you mix mix all that up. And once it's all cooked and ready, you dump that into your pot with your cooked vegetables and chicken. At this point, uh, if you have already spent a long time in the kitchen, because this does take a while, uh, this is a great resting point of the recipe if you want. So uh, still a little complicated because you need to cool a big vat of uh, chicken pot pie filling quickly. So a water bath really is the safest and fastest way to do that, uh, even though it is, again, more work. Uh, but if you do let the filling sit in the fridge overnight, it does the flavor enhances. Uh, but I'll say most of the time, I just turn this into a weekend day bake and keep on moving right ahead. Uh, so then you take your pie crust, bottom crust, pour in all the filling, really heap it over the top. And odds are very good, even with the heaping, you're going to have leftovers. Uh, it's what my family fondly calls the chicken pot pie guts, but I recognize that guts is maybe not the most appealing word, so you could use filling if you want, uh, but you're almost always will have extras of this. And that's great uh, because oftentimes when I'm making this pie, I'm making it for someone else. It's kind of my go-to if someone's having a baby or had surgery. Uh, it's a great thing to give uh, because you can bring it over already, but unbaked so that they can just have it ready. You can bring it over baked and the leftovers hold up really well. Uh, so oftentimes when I'm making this, I'm making it for someone else. So all I have are those little leftover guts to try it. And you could pour that over a puff pastry if you really wanted to be fancy, or you could just eat it out of the big pot, whatever, whatever works. After you heap and put on your top crust, fold the edges, uh, cut in some slits. I like to put an egg wash on the top uh, just because it ends up looking so much prettier if it browns. Uh, but if you've got someone with an egg allergy or you're busy or you don't feel like using an egg for it, it'll be fine without it. Uh, and if you do that egg wash, if you're feeling extra fancy, you can take some flake salt and sprinkle it on the top because it'll kind of sparkle when it's when it's done. But that's another step that you could easily skip. And then you bake it at 450 for about 45 minutes. Uh, you can tell it's done when the crust is nicely browned and you can see the filling bubbling through those slits. Uh, but it's also one of those things you can be really, um, uh, you don't have to be super cautious about it because you've already fully cooked the filling. Uh, so the worst is you get a crust that's a little gummy, uh, but usually you can see when the crust is done. Uh, I love this one because it is a recipe that is like fully through my family. Um, my mom tweaked a recipe she got from my aunt Lori, but she tweaked it so much she made it hers. And I uh, wrote to my aunt this morning to find out what her source was and uh, was not surprised to hear she just made it up because uh, this aunt is someone who cooks without a recipe. So it is truly in my family and I my family is a sharing family, so I'm really excited to be able to put that that recipe out there. And if any of you all try it, uh, or anyone who knows me uh, and doesn't want to invest in the big jar of the seasoning, just let me know, and I'll bring you a little baggie of chicken seasoning uh, so that you can try it first before uh, investing. I think it's for a 
canister this size, I think this costs like $18. So it is a little bit of an investment, but when you're using it a tablespoon or two at a time, it lasts. Whew. And that's chicken pot pie, the cheaty savory bake. <laughs> That sounds really, really tasty. I want to know more about the Zenders. Like, what's, can you tell us what's in it? Let's see. Or just like, not everything, but I can. Salt, dehydrated onion and garlic, sugar, potato flour. And then this is where they're kind of cheating because they say spice extractives, spices. <laughs> I, I got to keep their, their IP. Turmeric, paprika, and this is where the sticker is peeled so we don't know what the end is okay uh, but it's it's very savory um i assume i always assumed that it had some form of chicken in it like those chicken and a biscuit crackers but i don't think it does i think this is vegetarian um which is great because if you just leave the chicken out of the pot pie I, and use the veg vegetable vegetable broth instead of chicken broth uh, it could be a, a vegetarian pot pie as well. Totally. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I love that too. Awesome. It's great. Yeah. I'm through Frankenmuth all the time and I've never heard of that. So, I mean, I know what Zenders is, but I've never heard of the seasoning before. So I'm going to pop in there next time I'm in the area. Are you? Okay. I've never I mean, even been there. I, I think it's so cool because like a lot of families have pot pie recipes and I just like, and like, you know, chicken pot pie, is kind of like fundamentally the same, but I loved hearing like the slight differences between your families and my families and what makes it special to you and stuff like that. And it's just really cool. And that's awesome that it's a true family recipe. Yeah, I I also, I've been seeing the um, pot pies with the puff pastry on it, which I think also looks pretty cool. So I don't know if you didn't want to make a crust. Oh yeah, you know. or let's say you live by yourself or live with one other person and you don't want to commit to eating an entire pot pie at once even though it has potatoes in it it the filling freezes pretty well um so I, in the past i have made it and frozen it in like eight different containers and then you can thaw it on the stove pot in a just in a pot like you would if you were making soup uh, and bake one of those puff pastries and turn it into single serving chicken pot pie very nice how did you make that? Well, what I made, I, I really do like savory stuff, but I had to share this recipe and it's not the most savory thing because it's, it's, uh, it's from Joy Bauer and it's banana blueberry oatmeal bake. I know it's, it's not super sweet though. And that's why I uh, decided to go with it. Plus you, I just really wanted to share this because it's all in one dish. Um, you take two ripe bananas, three quarters of a cup of, uh, Greek yogurt, plain yogurt, um, two cups of almond milk or any milk of choice, uh, a couple of teaspoons of vanilla extract, a couple of tablespoons of honey or maple syrup, a couple of large eggs at room temperature, um, two cups of old fashioned oats, some cinnamon, baking powder, salt, and then you can use two cups of either fresh or frozen blueberries or whatever you have. The first time I made it, I happened to have frozen strawberries, so I used it that way. So what you do is you um, you mix your nine by 13 casserole dish with oil. You add the bananas, mash them up, add the yogurt, milk, vanilla, honey, or syrup. Your eggs crack right in there. You don't even need another dish. You stir it up, you know, um, make, you know, whip them up so it's all wet. Uh, mix and mash. You might have lumps. It's fine. Uh, add, add your oats, cinnamon, baking powder, salt, fresh or frozen blueberries, mix it together, bake for about 55 minutes. And you end up having like, it's kind of like, it's like oatmeal, but like a cake, but it's more oatmeal. -y. And boy, was it uh, just a a nice thing to have on some of these cold mornings we've had so so easy and and then what it says to slice it into large squares um and and garnish with the more yogurt or some blueberries or whatever you want and or not cinnamon it's super forgiving but boy I, I just I wanted you because I think even Elizabeth you could bake this and really be proud of yourself and 
uh, it was just soup and for um, leftovers, you know, pop it in the microwave for a minute and it was just super good and yummy. What was the texture like? Is it something that you could pick up and eat with your hands or is it really um, oatmeal? You could, you could, yeah, you, yeah, you could. Um, but I ended up because I wanted it warm, but it, you probably, you could eat it, you know, like that as is. Um, yeah, it's, it's really forgiving. In fact, the first time I made it, I didn't even have, I had like a little, I had like three different bottoms of milks that were all, you know, some, uh, plant-based and, uh, and it worked fine. Just, yeah, it's, it's great. When you have see yourself with a couple of ripe bananas, you should make it. I feel like that would be a great recipe for like, I was just thinking of this past Christmas. My mom was like running around trying to make this like nice breakfast and it was really good. But like, I was thinking, oh, next year we need to think of something just like easy to do. And I'm like, this is it. Cause you put, yeah, together, pop it in the oven, comes out. It's just like ready to go. You have your bowls and it's not like so hands-on and I yep. it's delicious and warm and you know, all that. So that seems totally. like a great and option. You could, you could mix, you know, put your different nuts and things out to make totally. it special for, you know, and individualize it. So, yeah, I really, um, just wanted to share that you can add more salt to make it savory <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that um, was that's what I made. So thank you. And uh, Katie, what did you make this time? Okay, well, I ended up making what's called an erbazone, which is a Italian Swiss chard pie. I saw this on an episode of America's Test Kitchen, the TV show on PBS. I was watching this show, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was very very hungry when i was watching it so it looked amazing and uh this is from the most recent season it's from the episode a heartier taste of italy but as i'm watching it i'm going like there's no way i'm ever making this i am not a baker so i was just like wow that's so complicated but it stuck with me and i kept on thinking about it and we had this episode coming up so i was like you know what what the heck i'm gonna make the erbazoni so i did i've literally never even made pie crust before so this is so outside of my box I was just like well, let's do it so you make your pie crust I have no idea if this is like a standard pie crust I bet it is but here's how you do it so you grate half a stick of butter and then you put it in the freezer and then you chop up some more butter and you pulse that in your food processor with some flour uh you just process that until you've got a nice dough and then you pull it apart and redistribute it back around your food processor, add some more flour and until, and then pulse it some more until it's broken into pieces that are like under an inch, put that into a bowl. And then you add your frozen grated butter and just toss that around until all your little pieces of butter are coated with the flour. Then you sprinkle some ice water in it mix it around, sprinkle a little bit more ice water until it is combined and the dough is sticking together. Divide the dough into half because you need two pieces. This is a rustic pie, so you don't use, um, don't use a pie tin or anything. We're using a baking sheet. So two separate pieces of pie dough, one for the top, one for the bottom. You put them in saran wrap and then shape them into like five inch squares cover them and you have to put them in the fridge for at least two hours or for up to two days. So I kind of missed that step the first time I was planning on making this. So, you know, read your full recipe is always a really good idea. Um, so once you've gotten that refrigerated, you need to take it out and sit it on the counter for like 10 minutes before you roll it. So while that's sitting out, you can start making your filling. You cook some oil and this calls for pancetta but I use thick cut bacon because in my experience that works just fine and it did so you brown up your pancetta until the fat is rendered using a slotted, slotted spoon pull that out of there and set it aside then you add some onion and some garlic into the fat cook that until that's fragrant 
Then you start adding your shard. So this ca this calls for three pounds of Swiss shard. So it's a lot. Doesn't look like it'll fit in a Dutch oven, but you start adding handfuls and it wilts. And of course it does all end up cooking down. Um, you cook that covered, uncovered in a series of steps until the liquid has evaporated. And so you've just got this nice Swiss chard mixture. Put that in a bowl to cool until it's like room temperature. So that takes like 30 minutes. And then you stir in some Parmesan and most of the pancetta that you cooked up. And they said you can also use ricotta here, but they specifically did not use ricotta on the television episode that I was watching because they said that it tends to make it a little bit soggy. So especially for my first time making this, I wanted to avoid that. So I left the ricotta out. Um, and then you start rolling out your dough. And I was so scared about this part. So you flour your counter, roll out your, your first piece of dough into a 10 by 14 rectangle. And then you have to roll it onto your rolling pin and then roll it out onto your greased baking sheet. I was so nervous, you guys, but it worked just like it did on the show, just like they said it would in the recipe. Then you put your Swiss chard mixture on top of that, leaving like an inch around the edges and you do an egg wash around the edges. So just brush that on. And then you roll out your other piece of dough, do the same exact thing. You're gonna lift it up with your rolling pan and roll it over the whole thing. And then you crimp the edges, like squeeze them together and then roll them up to crimp, make sure everything is contained. Take a sharp knife and you slice the top, just the top pastry, not getting into the filling at all, into 12 equal squares. Then you cover the whole thing in egg wash, sprinkle your little bit of reserved pancetta or bacon that you have left over the whole top of it. Then you bake it until it's golden brown and your pancetta is crisp. 30, 35 minutes, you rotate, rotate it in the middle, pull it out, let it uh, cool for like 30 minutes, transfer it to a cutting board, cut it up and serve. This was so tasty. I loved it. I was so impressed with myself. My husband was impressed. Um, I've got a picture of what it looked like. It did not look as nice as it did on the TV show. But for my first shot at something like this, I thought it looked beautiful. And it was uh, also really tasty as leftovers. I was really kind of shocked by that. Like just threw a couple of slices into the microwave for a minute or two. And I ate it with tomato soup. And it was like so good. So I don't know how often I will make this recipe, but I was super proud of myself for trying it and I will definitely do it again sometime. So yeah, it was good. Well, congratulations. That's Hi. a feat and it sounds, I mean, it sounds delicious, but good kudos to you for seeing that and deciding to tackle it. And I'm really happy it turned out because, you know, you want that kind of effort to pay off some. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, yes, yeah. And your um technique of of um grating the butter and putting it in the freezer, that's I mean that's the one thing that I've learned from my my husband and son about how the critical part of the butter having to mix in and that's what makes it flaky. There's a science behind it, yeah. and totally get the um the process there. So cool. good tip. Yeah, it just sounds fabulous. I'm going to ask a selfish question, which is, do you think it would work if you didn't include the Parmesan? Yeah. Or was the cheese? Oh, good. That was the answer I wanted because it sounds so good. Yeah, I definitely think you could leave the cheese out of it. And I think you would barely miss it because really the shard and the pancetta and the pie crust all, yeah, you it would be fine. Totally. Oh, good. I can't wait to try this. That sounds so good. Very cool. Okay, well, we want to thank everybody for watching Recipe Share and be sure to click the link below to look at the event page on aadl.org to find the recipes we talked about and to share your own in the comments. Join us next time when our category will be packable treats. We're looking forward to seeing what you've been making, so thanks for sharing. Recipe share.
share, less we do share, share a little less we do with less we do share.